to episode 231 of the Various and Sundry podcast. I'm your host, Matt Harmon, joined live in our virtual studio on the internet by my good friend, my colleague, my co-host, and the man who is freshly vacationed, John Scott Sloat. Well, you know, we we actually haven't had a moment to catch up yet, uh, Doc. I, I am freshly vacationed, but... You are uh, somewhat freshly returned to the United States after some international travel. Yes, that's right. That's right. So uh, I was in Ethiopia for a week. Nice. And where, what, what, how was that? What was the teaching like? You were working with some, uh, some uh, African pastors? Yes. So this was a group of 10, uh, 10 aspiring pastors slash church planters in uh Addis Ababa the capital of Ethiopia so nine of them are Ethiopian and one was Somali okay and give me give me a sense of Ethiopia like I, I virtually know nothing about the country um, other than it's in Africa well so I was only in the capital city and uh which I would have loved to explored more of the country but uh there's ongoing uh civil unrest outside of the capital and so there, it's not really smart to venture outside of the capital city uh so i was just in the in, in addis ababa which uh is a city of probably between 10 to 14 million okay. so massive okay. uh and uh yeah um one of the interesting facts about Ethiopia is it's basically the only African country that was never colonized. Really? Yes. The The hmm. Italians tried twice and failed. Interesting. Yes. Huh. So they're very proud of that, and understandably so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, But a great experience with, uh, I mean, most of these guys are in their, you know, mid-20s. Okay. In terms so of right, age right range. in your wheelhouse, you do well with yeah. the 20s guys. There you go. There you go. <laughs> um, and yeah, they're very sharp. I taught a course on Pauline theology. They ask good questions. Probably the biggest surprise, to be honest, was um, they they started asking a lot of questions about the new perspective on Paul. And I'm like, really. That conversation is has been over in the states for probably about five to seven years. Is there is there a large Anglican influence there? Because I I wonder if no uh, no no okay no no so it's uh, basically it's I mean the the the, the main uh, the, the the biggest sort of Christian uh, group is the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. Yes, yes, yes. I've heard of it. And so, um, and then after that, you know, you have a mixture of um, some Presbyterians, some Baptists, and, you know, generic evangelicals. Is the country mostly Muslim? Uh, it's two-thirds Christian, defined loosely, of course. Okay. Uh, and one-third and one -third Muslim. Okay. Hmm. Interesting. So, yeah. Yeah, great experience. Um, and I was well, well taken care of the, the guy who, uh, heads up the pastor's college, he's an American and he, uh, he took me out to dinner one night at what well, probably has to be either the nicest or one of the nicest restaurants in the city. Uh, it's on the, it's like on the 50th floor of a commercial bank, uh, you know, high rise and it has beautiful views of all around the city. And uh, the the restaurant was started by person uh, by President Obama's personal chef, who was Ethiopian. Really? Huh. Yeah, that's fascinating. And how was Ethiopian food for you? I was I've, good. I mean, yeah. I, I I didn't have a ton of it. I had a lot more Western food, but okay, okay. Uh, I did have the Ethiopian dishes I had were were very good. They're 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 big on meat. And, you know, I, I, I happen to like meat, so that works out well. 
that does work out well. Oh, interesting. <laughs> so I, yeah, I went to an ahead. Ethiopian restaurant one time and it had like this very thin bread that was spongy yep. that you like yep. ripped off and you, you picked up food with it and ate it. That's exactly right. Yep. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And so, um, that's traditional Ethiopian food. You don't use utensils. You use the bread hmm. to scoop stuff, stuff up, whether it's meat or, you know, vegetables or whatever else. Yeah. Nice. No, that's yeah. not, that sounds like a, sounds like a great trip. Um, yeah, it was, it was except for the, uh, just a long time on an airplane. So you where know? all did you fly through? You've, I imagine you flew out of Chicago. Yeah. Uh, on the way there, it was direct. Wow. So that's like just under 14 hours. Holy smokes. There's a direct from Chicago to Ethiopia? Every day. Yeah. Who knew? Yeah. <laughs> yes, indeed. That's wild. Uh, on, on the way back, it was basically direct, except for you stop for fuel in Rome. So you land in Rome, you refuel, but you don't get off the plane. Do you get a pizza or anything when you land? Or Nope. Nope. So Gelato. that's closer to... That's closer to 17 hours. Oh, goodness. That's a long any, time on an airplane. Any good movies on the plane? Any any <laughs> any good books? You know, I I watched several movies. Uh, I think the most interesting one was actually, um, there was a movie made about Richard Jewell. Does that name ring a bell at all? No. Okay. I didn't think so. So he was a security guard in Atlanta, who discovered the bomb that was placed in Olympic Park during the Olympics. Okay, I do remember the premise of this movie, yes. Okay, and so he discovers the bomb. He's he's lauded as this hero, and then the FBI decides, no, we think he actually planted it. Hmm. They basically ruin this guy's life uh, before they finally realize, yeah, actually, he didn't. So... It was, uh, it was good. It was good. Interesting. Interesting. Well, you've also been on the road, not as far as Ethiopia. No, no, we were in, we were in St. Augustine for a little over a week. Uh, and we go there every year. We love going down there. It's a, it's a spot. Probably the story worth telling from that trip is our flights there. Mm -hmm. Um, so we flew out, Saturday of Memorial Day weekend. Mm -hmm. And we were flying out of Detroit into Baltimore for a connection, so BWI. Yep. And then from Baltimore to Jacksonville. And so we, uh, you know, I, I'm, and I think you're the same way. I'm going to, I know I don't need to arrive two hours in advance, but I'm going to. Maybe even two fifteen. You know, you know. Uh, I like to be there in advance just to not be stressed yep. out going through security. Hundred uh, percent. This is why we travel well together. You know, <laughs> other people I travel with, um, and I'm not talking about my wife here, roll their eyes and go like, "Why do you need to arrive that early?" You know, there's there's no need for that, and yeah. I just don't want to feel stressed. Anyway, so I get in the play. I get in the shuttle to go to the airport. And I get a text from Southwest Airlines. I will name check them uh, <laughs> that my plane has been delayed an hour. I'm sitting there going, "No biggie. We have uh, we have 90 minutes in uh, Baltimore for our layover. We'll we'll be just fine." We get to the front gate, and all of a sudden, we see our plane is being pushed back in like seven to ten minute increments every every 20 minutes. Yeah. And all of a sudden it looks like we're going to arrive with about 15, 20 minutes to spare. And the gate agent's like, they're going to hold the plane for you. They're going to hold the plane for you. <laughs> Which if you've, if you've flown before is code for, let's get you out of here. So you're not my problem. Exactly. Um, yes. <laughs> and we get, uh, we get on the plane and they, and it's sunny, blue skies and in Baltimore, blue skies. And they say, yeah, everybody, there's a storm over Pittsburgh. That's pretty aggressive. And so 
we're going to wait it out here on the runway in Detroit. And we sat there for 40 minutes. Ugh. And so, uh, and they keep coming on the speaker on the plane saying, they're going to do their best to hold flights. They're going to do their best to hold flights, all these things. Well, finally they come on and say, we got a new flight path. We're going. And right before we leave, I pull up, I have an app that tracks all this. Yeah. Is it flight cost- aware? Yeah. Flight aware or flighty is the other one that I like. Yeah. Um, it, cr- both, uh, the, my apps crossed out the word Baltimore and put, uh, Reagan in there instead. And so I was like, oh my goodness, we're not going to Baltimore. We're going to Reagan. And, you know, and just trying to think like, all right, what do we do? How do we, how do we, pl-? and then, and then about 10 minutes later, I got rerouted about back to Baltimore. So we landed in Baltimore. We get off the plane. Our plane left like 30 minutes ago. They just, they just weren't going to hold it. And so we talked to the gate agent and she goes, yeah, sorry, it left. I'm like, okay, well, can, can we have some vouchers for some hotels? I go, yeah, since this was weather related, um, we're not giving you any vouchers. And nice. And so I, I kind of go like, well, it that's true. It was somewhat weather weather related, but the majority of the delay was on you. Mm-hmm. Um, and they say, listen, call this number, whatever. Um so again. It, it's somebody else's problem. Somebody else's problem. Exactly. <laughs> so we go, so I, I book a hotel on the app on my phone, on the Hilton app. And I get a call five minutes later from this Hilton hotel going like, yeah, we're booked solid. We don't actually know how you booked that hotel room. <laughs> okay. And so I went on and I booked another one. Didn't hear anything. We went down to get our luggage. They said, yeah, we can get your luggage, but it's going to be three hours for us to get your luggage. <laughs> and so I was like, forget that. I'm just going to, we'll just wear, we'll just wear the clothes on our back, basically. Yeah. And so we got an Uber ride to this hotel. We're pushing like 10 p.m. at this point. We get to our hotel. We go to check in at the front desk and they go, when did, when did you get this room? I'm like, like 20 minutes ago. I said, yeah, we've been booked solid for a while. There are no rooms available here. <laughs> and then they went, we don't know how you did this. So then I start calling hotels. And then I realized it is, it's Memorial Day weekend. It's graduation weekend for the Naval Academy in Baltimore mm-hmm. and Johns Hopkins. Yeah. There is not, there is not a hotel anywhere. We had, we eventually got a hotel 45 minutes away from the airport that we had to Uber for uh, back and forth. It was awful. <laughs> um, so we we get back to the, we fly out the next morning. We get there. Southwest sends me one of those. How was your trip? Survey things, and I just ripped them a new <laughs> one. I mean, I just tore the. I, I I probably spent thirty minutes on this survey. I mean, just just absolutely, absolutely destroying them. I get an email a day later saying, hey, we realized this did not go the way you wanted it to. Here's two $200 vouchers for you. Uh, So in the end, Southwest did the right thing, gave me my money back. That second Hilton hotel, by the way, that that didn't have a room, charged me for that room. And uh, I just got the refund yesterday. (laughs) Fun. So yes, it was was a crazy experience. But I, you know, it all worked. We got to our vacation probably about a, you know, fourteen hours later than we anticipated, but we got there. Mm-hmm. There you go. We got there. So, um, other than getting there, uh, things went things went well on the vacation. Relaxing. Oh yeah. Time. Oh yeah. Walks walking on the beach every day. Going out to dinner. Um, playing mini golf, you know, you know, doing all those things are just incredibly relaxing. I think I took a nap every day. I didn't set an alarm. It was awesome. <laughs> so, um, since you go back to the same place, yeah. uh, did you rekindle some, uh, burgeoning friendships with, uh, with the locals down there? <laughs> so there is a, 
shave ice place we always go to called Mr. Morgan's. Yes, you've mentioned this. Yeah. And uh, we met the wife, Mr. Morgan, and got to talk to her. And Would that like, not be Mrs. Morgan then? Mrs. Morgan, yes. And got to talk to her a little bit. And she was just like, well, you know, I was like, because we say some, we told her sometimes we're down in December and they're not open. And she goes, well, this is the second business for us. We're like, oh, we know your husband's a middle school principal uh, and you work in the school system as well. So you guys are very tied to the school calendar and you're only open mm -hmm. really Memorial Day to Labor Day. Yeah. And she just started laughing, like the fact that we knew a, a, about her, her story. So yeah. um, really we have, we probably have more relationships just with the restaurants there or even like the little condo complex we stay at like uh, the maintenance guy knows our name. Um, and so we stop and talk to the maintenance guy uh, down there. Um, and yeah, it's, it's just a good, it's just a fun place to go. It's not like Daytona beach. Have you ever been to Daytona beach? I have. Oh yeah. Like high rises on the beach, right? Mm -hmm. It's not yeah. like that. Nothing higher than three stories. And St. Augustine's a beautiful, beautiful town. Um, there's a, Presbyterian USA uh, church down there that looks like it's Greek Orthodox. Uh, there's a Catholic <laughs> church from the 1700s that's down there. Um, it's it's a very very pretty town and and just has a very Spanish feel to it. It's a lot of fun. Nice. Okay. All right. Well, if you would like to get in touch with the show and ask either of us more about our various and sundry travels you can find us on x at vns pod you can email the show various and sundry podcast at gmail.com we're on facebook and on youtube and we would love for you to leave a five star rating i'm just gonna suggest here since we're already uh, we know this episode's gonna go long but uh one way i think we can shorten it is We'll just talk briefly about sports and really the big story being NBA playoffs that we've reached yep. the stage of the, of the NBA finals. So uh, Celtics and Mavs on your vacation. Did you manage to watch any uh, basketball? Okay. Nope. No basketball. All right. So um, yeah. So any, any, uh, any predictions on who's going to win the finals start this Thursday, June 6th. Um. I am rooting for the Mavericks. I am rooting for the Mavericks as well. Um, as, Do you think even they will though win, I'm not though? a huge Kyrie fan, um, mm -hmm. I, I like the Luka Donk Luka story. Yeah, um, I probably more more m mostly I don't like the Celtics. So yeah, I'm the same. Um, I I do like Luka though. It feels like he has elevated his level not just of his play but also of his trash talking, which I'm not the biggest fan of. Um, he has, uh, definitely, uh, been barking more at the officials and the crowd. Uh, you know, I guess he's backing it up with his play. He's been terrific. Uh, but he and Kyrie together form quite a, quite a dynamic duo, um, which I, I, I hope continues on into the, into the finals here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Perhaps uh, how good is Lucas English? I don't know that I've ever seen a interview with him. It's pretty good. It's pretty good. I was about to say yeah. maybe maybe his trash talking is getting better the more comfortable he is with the English language. <laughs> well, he seems to know all the words. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> yeah, the important words for trash talking. Yeah. 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 Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yes. So. Uh, so yeah, let's let's leave the the sports uh segment at that i think um fine by but, me i don't have to talk about the mets oh my goodness yeah. there you go i had on here uh, a couple of other headlines but we can table that for for a later episode ne n neither the other stuff uh, other things i had were, were time sensitive um i it's hard to pivot to this next part of the program here but it is uh something i wanted to talk about um Within the since the time we recorded uh, the last episode, a a a a a friend of mine and a friend of the show, uh, one of the few guests who has ever appeared on the Various Sundry podcast, 
Uh, Randy Newman uh, passed away Mm. uh, unexpectedly at the age of 68. Uh, Randy was a was a friend of mine back from my days involved in crew and uh, we chose his book um we did questioning evangelism didn't we is that what we did i think he, we did, he's written it's a mere evangelism mere evangelism that's what it was he's written several books on evangelism that's why i've 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 managed to forget which one we did but um and he just actually had a book come out about 3 months ago hmm uh, called questioning faith where he tells different stories about people's conversions as, as usual very good very inter- very interesting so um yeah just a, a sad note to pass along randy's death uh he he was a jewish believer who who um had a heart for evangelism not just for uh, his fellow uh his fellow jews but also for just uh anyone who needed christ and he had a gift for communicating the gospel clearly, using questions, using humor. Um, and so um, I am confident that when he did pass away, uh, he heard those coveted words, well done, good and faithful servant. Hmm. So wanted to pass that along. Uh, he, uh, yeah, I mentioned the book that he just published. And uh, there's actually an article that just came out like last week on desiring God that he had written. I think that's in connection with that book. So hmm. um, we will, uh, if I can find that, perhaps we can throw a link into the, uh, <clears throat> into the show notes. Well, there's no easy way to transition, but we're going to do it anyway. So uh, we are on to our summer read and we are continuing our discussion of uh, Patrick Schreiner's book, the transfiguration of Christ an exegetical and theological reading. Uh, This uh, episode brings us to uh, chapter four, which focuses on what he refers to as the glorious sayings. So uh, focusing on in particular what what the heavenly voice says, uh, as well as what each individual person says. So what Peter says, what the heavenly voice says, uh, etc. So um, he starts the chapter, though, by uh, r- describing what he calls a Christological grammar. And he used this as kind of a, uh, a starting point for making sure we we talk about what's going on here in a way that's consistent with um, with orthodoxy, essentially. And so, he, he puts out four Christological rules. Uh, first, the Son is truly God and truly man without confusion of those two natures. Second, the Son is truly God and truly man, but in one subject. Third, the Son is doubly begotten. And then fourth, the as he puts it, the net profit of the incarnation is not a decrease of the Son's divinity, but an exaltation of his humanity. And so he kind of sets those out as the uh, uh, the framework to avoid making Christological mistakes. Well, and those, those tend to be highlights of the Nicene, uh, Nicene Creed and, and the Chalcedon definition. Yep, uh, absolutely. Well. Yeah, that's where he's really drawing those from. Um. And so, uh, yeah, and then he, uh, from there, uh, moves into uh, what Peter says and how we should interpret Peter's uh, words. So basically the idea of Peter saying some version of, hey, it's good to be here. Uh, Let's build some tents, one for Moses, one for you, and one for Elijah. So um, how... So he he kind of gave, uh, I believe, three different ways that that's been read. How how have you read that historically? Like, um, is it an allusion to the tent of meeting? Is it does it have to do with the feast of tabernacles? Is it eternal? You you know how how have you read that um, historically? Yeah, um, I have tended to see it. Um, more as uh, connected to the uh, Feast of Tabernacles, 
that's been my my general starting point. Um, so yeah, it, I, you know, he 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 say he lays out that option. He lays out connecting it to tent of the tent of meeting in the wilderness, and then also uh, the eternal tents in which the righteous will dwell with angels at the end time. Um, I I think uh, for me that seems like it's uh, maybe the least likely. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I think his discussion there is, is, is interesting. Um, you know, he kind of concludes with saying Peter's error is, uh, lies in his confusion about Jesus singularity and his suffering. Mm -hmm. The, the voice from heaven confronts Peter's ill-formed conception of Jesus unique divine status and his messianic mission. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I think that's also how I've always taken it in terms of when I've taught this passage to stress the, you know, on the one hand, it's it's a remarkable statement of how highly Peter thinks of Jesus, that he puts them on the same level as two of the greats from the Old Testament, Moses oh, and yeah. Elijah. Yeah. So now you've got two of the, you know, if you made a list of the top 10 Old Testament figures— Obviously, Moses definitely makes the list, and Elijah's at least, you know, in the list or on the on on the edge of the list. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so to put uh, to put Jesus on that same level in one sense is actually a pretty uh, pretty impressive thing, and yet the text pushes you in the direction of Jesus is so transcendent and so unique that he's in his own category. Moses wants to put Jesus on the same level. Or sorry, Peter wants to put Jesus on the same level as Moses and Elijah, and the heavenly voice makes it clear that that's uh, that we're talking different categories. Like we're, yeah. we're 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 completely different categories here. I, I appreciated Patrick's statement on one hundred and one, sort of uh, right in the middle of that first full paragraph. Jesus is not a triumvirate of equals with Moses and Elijah. He is exclusive. Mm -hmm. Even Peter's recognition of Jesus as Messiah doesn't go far enough. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And that's where that, that ties in even to um, the divine voice, God's voice saying, this is my beloved son. Mm -hmm. uh, tying in, of course, to both uh, Genesis 22, picking up language applied to Isaac in the story about the near sacrifice of, of Isaac, uh, as well as Psalm two verse seven, uh, which is a Psalm that is, uh, talking about the Lord's anointed King. Um, and he even picks up, you know, language in there of Isaiah 42, one in the suffering, uh, suffering servant, Daniel seven. So there's a lot in here that he picks up, uh, and then the language of listen to him, of course, is drawn from uh, Deuteronomy 20, or sorry, Deuteronomy 18, and the promise of a prophet greater than Moses. I believe he calls that the new Shema as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which which yeah. was a which I, I think was a helpful category for me. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh so I I think what uh what stands out about about Patrick's treatment here, though, is that um, again his attempt to merge both systematic and biblical theology, as well as even historical theology, with the yeah. use of the with the use of the uh, sort of Christological grammar that he's using in there, mm -hmm. uh, which I do think is helpful. I do think this is a that's one of the things that sets uh, Schreiner's work apart. Here is uh, that that kind of uh, integration of those things you know i guess the challenge can become sometimes you know is is there a danger of over reading into the text things that are later formulations of you know theological doctrine you know what i mean like i think that's part of the tension i think of, of sort of the historical theology and even the systematic theology piece can be making sure that we're not reading into the text things that are maybe are latent in the text 
and our 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 right extensions of it mm -hmm. but maybe not directly in the mind of the biblical author mm -hmm. yeah that that strikes me as um, the possibility of a lot of error um potentially mm -hmm. or or missing what is clearly evident without those categories um however I, right i think patrick does a good job and i th think he does a good job because he's in it right he does he mm -hmm. seems to do quite a bit of reading in the historical uh in the historical record seemingly yes yeah yeah absolutely um yeah and i think uh i appreciate patrick's point in here about part of what peter is missing in in in, tr in trying to extend the like hey let's build tents and stick around here is that uh, in one sense, Peter's being given a glimpse of the not yet by seeing the face of Jesus in its glory, but he's forgetting the fact that it still is not yet in terms of there's still the cross to come. There's still his suffering sure. that's going to make that possible for him to uh, accomplish that to uh, and to uh, include his people within that. Um, one thing that I appreciate, just uh, just one of the things Patrick picked up on, and I think I think it's just a very careful reading of the text um, that the heavenly voice actually interrupts Peter. Uh, that <laughs> yeah, you know that that Peter yeah. seems to be, and I think it's cast this way a lot, but it seems to be the guy that just sort of opens his mouth and just starts going, mm -hmm. and. Uh, um, in, He's in the, the verbal midst... processor among the uh, disciples. Oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, and the heavenly voice interrupts him, which I'm not sure adds a ton of meaning to the text, but gives you a vivid picture of what's happening there. Yeah, yeah. I, I think one of my favorite pieces of the text is in Matthew's account, is uh, how he kind of concludes the 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 little section here when. You know, the, the heavenly voice speaks, and then uh, <clears throat> Matthew concludes it with something like, uh, and they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. Like <laughs> trying to, like, it, it's Matthew's way of, of, of saying Jesus is in a completely different category than Moses and Elijah. And as well meaning as your attempts to put him on the same level as Elijah and Moses were um it's a terrible category mistake yeah and the uniqueness of the sun comes out even more clearly that way so yeah well there's a ton more in there uh that we could have talked about but um i think in the interest of time we're gonna have to table our discussion there for next week make sure you read chapter five um, in the conclusion right are we doing five and the conclusion well, actually, <clears throat> this is something we didn't talk about before the pod. Since we've had to push back our interview with Patrick, okay, we need. We I'm going to suggest week. we push the conclusion back to the following week. Okay, that sounds great. Okay, so just chapter five for next week. Thus ends production meeting of the Very Sundry <laughs> Podcast. See, people are getting a glimpse behind the curtain here. Yes, <laughs> whether they wanted it or not, they're getting it. So, this is what happens when we don't record for a couple of weeks and have to uh, kind of fly by the seat of our pants a little bit here. But uh, we apologize if the free entertainment that we provide for you is uh, not quite up to the standards you would like. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So John, let's move on now to our actual main topic. Now that we're 34 minutes into the pod. Yeah. We'll, we'll keep it short. <laughs> <clears throat> All right. We're, we're back to part three now of the English reformation. Yeah. So, why don't you remind us just briefly where we ended last episode? So um, um, last week we spent a good bit of, or last week, I suppose. It, well, I suppose when our listeners heard it, it was last week. But for us, it was it was two, three weeks ago now. Something uh, like that. And uh, we had talked about King Henry VIII uh, and particularly his um, separation, annulment of his marriage uh, to Catherine of Aragon mm -hmm. and uh, how that led uh, him 
uh, and the English church leaving the Catholic church and, and uh, King Henry VIII declaring himself the head of the church of England um, yeah. and beginning what is known today as uh, Anglicanism or uh, I guess here in the States. Well, some spots in the States, Anglicanism is making a bit of a resurgence. Uh, oh yeah. Yeah. Don't be, you know, we have a certain friend who would, who would take umbrage of us, uh, putting them together, put, equating Episcopalian and, uh, and Anglican, even though of course, historically there is a, a, a connection, but yep. Yep. But I understand his frustration with that. Uh, yeah, but he also doesn't it, listen to the podcast, so feel free to, to yeah, he'll, continue. he'll never learn. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and then and then we sort of walked through the remain his, his other five wives and how that was connected to uh, theology, church history, things like that. Uh, the the way people were trying to move him toward a more Protestant or more Catholic persuasion. Um, so how was that? Did that did that? Yeah, that's great. Okay, okay, yeah, that's great. So picking up this week, uh, so Henry the Eighth is dead now. He's he's dead and gone, dead and gone. Uh, However, he leaves behind uh, 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 really three children. Um, he leaves behind his son, Edward, uh, his daughter, Mary, and his daughter, Elizabeth, who will, who will all claim the throne at some point. Uh, he also leaves behind a all his advisors at this point were Protestants. You know, all mm -hmm. the Catholic advisors wanted him to return to the Catholic Church, so he, he got rid of them and installed very pro-Protestant um, advisors for himself, uh, pro-Protestant uh, tutors for his son, Edward, uh, who was to become king. He needed a male heir. And so Edward uh, takes the throne, um, has been uh, surrounded by Protestants his, his whole life, educated by Protestants, and... Uh, the the privy council that's established the council that's supposed to rule in his stead until he's he's fully ready to become king is uh is made up of protestants as well and so there there is just a lot of protestant influence in edward's life and so when he comes to the throne at 9 after the death of his father he pushes forward reformation in england uh, bringing preachers into his court, uh, hearing Protestant theology against Catholic, against Catholics, uh, really, really living it up uh, as a Protestant. And this uh, this gets a number of people to become uh, very bold in their Protestantism in ways that they hadn't been previously. So uh, Cranmer, for instance. Uh, publishes a book of common prayer during this time. That's not something really we've talked about or focused on, but publishes a new book of common prayer when Edward is on the throne and is just just very uh, uh, anti-Catholic mm -hmm. in, in its uh, in its rhetoric. And uh, so Edward's on the throne. However, he only is on the throne for six years. Dies at the age of oh fourteen or fifteen. Uh, a little bit about him. He, by 13, he could read Greek and Latin um, as, you know, most 13 year olds should. Uh, Absolutely. But yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah we're, we're fairly pro uh, uh, classical education here. Yeah. Um, um, he, he often gets uh, emboldened. Uh, I mean, that's not, that's not what I mean. He often gets portrayed uh, as this kind of staunch Calvinist, um, which I'm, I, I don't believe he totally was. I think the staunch Calvinists that come along a little bit later, uh, that return from Geneva, mm -hmm. look back at the time of Edward with such fondness. Uh, in fact, there's a book by uh, uh, J.C. Ryle that I have called Five Good English Reformers or Five English Reformers. Uh, that talks glowingly of the time of Edward. I mean, talk about him being like this, oh my goodness, this wonderful, wonderful man who was on the throne. Dude died at 16. You know, um, <laughs> he was he was quite young. Um, so he dies probably from uh, tuberculosis. 
Uh, and these Protestant players who had made some pretty aggressive moves uh, in uh, English society were, were, were in for it. Um, following Edward, uh, we have uh, Mary Tudor come to the throne. Now, this is the daughter of uh, Henry VIII and uh, Catherine of Aragon, his, his, his uh, first wife. And uh, she she is just a wildly, wildly bitter person. Um, and I think understandably so. Um, <laughs> right? There, there was a court uh, that was held in a, a Protestant court, uh, including, and, and Cranmer was the, was the big force on this that declared her birth illegitimate. Uh, and I'm not using strong enough language there to, to describe how they declared her birth, right? Uh, yeah. But uh, we want to keep this non-explicit. Um, uh, she believed she actually had more of a claim to the throne than Edward did. And so was upset that Edward was king when she wasn't queen. Uh, she was separated from her mother for the remainder of her mother's life. Um, Henry wouldn't let her visit her, wouldn't let her do anything. Um, she was, uh, uh, more of a chess piece marriage wise, uh, to, to Henry, um, than than anything else uh but by mm -hmm. giving her hand in marriage um so you know uh mary who becomes known as bloody mary uh certainly did some terrible things and, and killed some people but also had a, a, a pretty uh terrible upbringing you know as well as much as much of a terrible upbringing as i suppose somebody in royalty in uh in the 1500s could have um um, she, she wasn't allowed to marry someone in England. So she married Philip of Spain. Uh, and, uh, now he was a prince in Spain or a king, the king, I believe a prince in Spain. I don't actually have okay. it in my notes. Um, but Philip's family is the same one that put Luther on trial. So, I mean, you could imagine, uh, he was, he was fairly Catholic if that's the case. Um, and this really freaked out the Protestants in England, um, however, they had a wildly uh, unhappy marriage. Um, in fact, Mary was, I, I don't know if liar is the right term or if self-deceived, but uh, a couple of times she came forward and said, I'm pregnant, I'm having a baby. Um, and she would go away for a few months and come out and basically say, I'm actually not pregnant. I'm actually not. And this happened two or three times. Eventually she does die of stomach cancer. And so, so there's been some, you know, historical speculation of there, whether it was just like, well, her stomach was growing and it was this cancer and she thought it yeah. was actually a baby, but, but it wasn't. Um, throughout England, she restored a good bit of Catholicism, Catholicism. Uh, and um, so she, she undoes a good bit of what Edward had done uh, and a good bit of what Henry had done. Um, and she was a big persecutor of Protestants. So she kills something close to 300 Protestants uh, and the rest flee uh, the country. So I just want to focus on two that she killed real quick. Uh, Bishop Hooper, who is over, uh, oh my goodness, uh, Gloucester. How do you pronounce that? You're better with English towns. Uh, I, I believe that's uh, either Gloucester or Gloucester. Okay. One of those. Um, he was, he was a pretty fiery preacher. Um, um, my book, hot Protestants calls him like the first, uh, you know, <laughs> that gets you every it's time. The title of it? that book, the title <laughs> of the book gets me every time. Yeah. Um, ca calls him kind of the first, uh, Puritan or a proto Puritan. Uh, um, ultimately he's, uh, taken by Mary uh, and, and her people, obviously, and burned at the stake in 1555. Uh, there, there's a good bit of detail that you can read about. It's captured in uh, in uh, Fox's books, Book of Martyrs. But um, beats his breath uh, while praying to God um, until his arm fell off uh, fr from the flames. Hmm. Uh Cranmer as well, uh, she killed. Um, so Cranmer is a really fascinating character, sort of a behind the scenes puppet master uh, from Henry VIII um, up until now. And you can tell he's really political, sa politically savvy because 
when Mary comes to the throne and arrests him and says, we're going to kill you unless you recant, he recants. <laughs> um, and so uh, he signs the recantation. And re remember, this is the same person that declared the current queen an illegitimate child. Mm -hmm. She goes, we're going to kill you anyway. We're, <laughs> we're just going to go through with it. Yeah. And so they give him an opportunity to preach for whatever reason uh, before he's burned at the stake. Um, sort of like a last word, I suppose. Uh, but he gets up there and just starts attacking Catholic doctrine, attacking the queen, doing all these things. And they take him, they take him to the stake and he's, he's burned, uh, burned alive. Um, mm -hmm. Because of this, thousands uh, fled to Europe, mostly uh, to Switzerland, Geneva, um, and this is really where we get the idea of of sort of those um, uh, English Calvinists uh, come from. So, mm -hmm. uh, spoilers, Mary, Mary does die. And all the English people that have been in Switzerland, Geneva, uh, make their way back to England and are, are sort, of, sort of these hardened Calvinists uh, at this time. Um, it's Protestantism with with a bit of an edge uh, that comes through. Um. Yeah, and I, I think that's where we'll leave it. Uh, she okay. persecutes to the point where thousands of Protestants leave England. Um, and when she passes away, they they ultimately come back. Uh, however, they never come back and are like shummy with the with the king ever again. I mean, right? They they eventually behead one uh, that we, that we won't get to. <laughs> but uh, but yeah. Anyway, we'll leave it there. Okay. Yeah. Yes. So, um, all right. So we had, uh, good old Edward. We had bloody Mary. Any real, any connection to the actual drink known as a bloody Mary? That's a good question. Believe it or not, it's not one that comes up in a Grace College classroom too much. Mm, okay. Um, I know missed opportunity for sure, but I, I believe it's named after her. Um, but, I, but I don't know that for certain. Okay. Well, we'll have to go to other sources apparently to uh to satisfy that curiosity. I'll check with my mixologist. Yeah. Okay. Yes, there you go. Time now for this day in sports history. All right, this day in sports history, June 4th. June yeah. 4th. The year is flying by, isn't it? It is. Uh June 4th, uh 1913. Uh English suffrage uh, oh, excuse me. Uh, suffragette. Am I getting that suffragette, right? Suffragette. Yeah. Suffragette. Uh, Emily David uh, Davison is trampled and mortally wounded by a racehorse called Anmer, ridden by Herbert Jones, owned by King George V. Uh, during the running of the Derby at uh, Epsom Downs in Surrey. Jones is thrown from the horse. The horse finishes the race jockeyless. Uh, Davison dies from her injuries four days later. Seemed like a good fit with our focus on the English Reformation. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the king trampling on people. Absolutely. That that seems yeah. like a like a good connection. Yeah. Um, I don't know much what what else to say about it. To tell you the truth, um, I don't either. 1964, uh, more in our wheelhouse, uh, the Los Angeles Dodgers uh, pitcher Sandy Koufax tosses his third career no-hitter, beats the Phillies 3-0 in Philadelphia. Okay. I like Koufax. Yep. <clears throat> 1977, uh, French Open women's tennis, uh, Mima uh, Janzevic of Yugoslavia wins her lone Grand Slam single title, beats... Uh, Florenta Miha of Romania, 6267-61. Okay. Yeah. I noticed you didn't connect, correct any of my Well, I think there. it's probably Mima Yaushevich Yau would be my guess. And then Florentia, because there's a, I don't know what that is below the, the T there, but it's some sort of symbol that indicates, I think that's a ch sound. Oh, oh see, I thought that was with the next line to tell you the truth. Mm, um, no, Mihai, Mihai of Romania. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You're in the ballpark. Yeah. I, I feel, you know, with some of these Eastern European names, I feel 
I feel like I deserve a participation trophy just for showing up to pronounce them. You know? Agreed. Agreed. Anyway, 1993 Cricket's Ball of the Century Australian spin bowler Shane Warne bowls England batsman Mike Gatting with his first ball of a of an Ashes series. Australia wins first test at Old Trafford by 179 runs. Well done on reading a sentence that you have no idea what it means. Yes. <laughs> it's not normal when I read an English sentence. I don't know how any of the words connect to the other words. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Um, 1995, New Zealand creates world record score for rugby union uh, international in thrashing. Is that, is that thrashing Japan? Yeah, I think that's just a I think that's just a colloquial term for like beating them badly. I don't think oh, there's that's any not like a town name. Okay. Yeah. I thought, wow, that's a funny name for a Japanese town. Uh 145 uh to 17 in the World Cup in Bluefontein. Is that Russia? I believe that's Republic of South Africa. Republic of South Africa. Mark Ellis, uh six tries, uh Simon Kulhan. Uh, 20 conversions. That's a lot of points for a rugby match. 145. 145 is a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 2022, uh, just two short years ago, uh, French Open women's tennis, uh, Polish world number one, uh, Swiatek beats American teenage Coco Goff, 6163 for her second French singles title. Is there a reason you omitted uh, her first name? Iga. Oh, I just missed Sw- Iga. Okay. It's Iga. Yeah. Or, yeah. I believe it's Iga. Iga? Iga? It could be Iga, I guess. Yeah. Shwa- Sh- Shwitek? Something Shwitek. like that. Shwitek. Yeah. It okay. sounds like a smartwatch. There you go. All right. But... So uh, who do you like out of the list? Oh, my goodness. Um um, maybe a- Emily Davidson uh, is uh, is a pretty interesting one in that list. I mean, it would go well, well with our English Reformation uh, series. Yeah, is it the one you were thinking of? Uh, I'm fine with that. I mean, I also okay. it's also one that you can pronounce. So you know, there's there's that advantage as well. Well, I also got Sandy Koufax uh, as well. That's true. So those those are That's basically true. my two options here. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's true. One thing you liked. Uh, I am just going to, I've already raised a little bit about it, but St. Augustine, Florida. Uh, great little town uh, that St. Augustine never visited. Um, uh, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, what's funny is everything in that town is, we're the oldest city. We're the oldest city. Uh, yeah. Everything there. Like I have a book downstairs in the history and it's oldest city. They don't have the little side comment in North America. Or yeah. by Europeans, or or right, established like by Europeans, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but like everything's ancient city, ancient city brunch bar, or what, whatever. Yeah. There. So, but St. Yeah. Augustine, Florida, great place to visit. Um, I have recommendations if if you're going. So hit me up. All right. So there's obviously debate as to whether one should say Augustine or Augustine in theological discussions, though, sure. from what I understand, it's supposed to be Augustine, not Augustine. Mm-hmm. Uh, so is there debate as to how to pronounce the, the city or is it it's always St. Augustine? St. Augustine. St. Augustine. Saint Augustine. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Augustine is the person. Augustine is a city in Florida. OK. OK. All right. Uh, I'm going to go with, uh, obviously, I could go with the Ethiopia trip. We talked a little bit about that. But I'm going to go with uh, this past weekend, uh, Jake, my son Jake, and his fiance Autumn had a, uh, I guess these are called wedding showers now. Like, it used to be common that you did, like, bridal showers. Okay? Yeah. But now, apparently, the thing is to do a couple's shower where both are there. Okay. And so both the wedding parties were there, like, gr- groomsmen, bridesmaid family, some family friends. So it was a big uh, shindig at her parents' home and her parents know how to throw a good party. Uh, Terrific food Mm. catered by a, uh, 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 
a chef that's starting a new restaurant there locally. Um, just some amazing uh, pork, I believe it's pork shoulder. They had mm. these uh, uh, meatballs that were uh, like veal mixed with something else that were delicious. Mm. Just amazing food. And uh, so uh, my wife's family, uh, several, so her parents came for this all the way from Nebraska, along with uh, her sister-in-law and a couple and uh, two of our nephews and uh, one of our nieces. So they all came. Uh, so it was a big, big event, big Hudson family celebration, uh, uh, the Hudson family joining us for that. So um a lot of fun a lot of fun so nice yeah so that is my one thing i liked all right john we have uh we have done a lot in this episode we've at least attempted to do a lot i don't know if we've done it well but we've done a lot uh we have talked um about our various and sundry travels we've talked briefly about uh, NBA Finals starting. We've talked briefly about the passing of uh, our friend Randy Newman. We've talked about Chapter 4 of Patrick Schreiner's book, The Transfiguration of Christ. Uh, please read Chapter 5 for next week to keep up with our discussion. We've talked about Part 3 of the English Reformation, including Edward and Bloody Mary. We have talked about English suffragette Emily Davison being trampled to death by a horse. We've talked about John's vacation in St. Augustine, and we've talked about the couple's shower for my son and his fiance. So I think by definition, we have covered our various and sundry topics. And so all that's left to say is, until next time, the Lord bless you all real good. Later. Later.